Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. My name is Joe Lopez with the Richard Nixon Foundation, and thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, before I introduce our featured speaker this evening, I want to talk about a few of our upcoming events that we have this fall, uh, two in particular. On Monday, October 20th at 7 p.m., we have former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who is going to give his predictions for the upcoming midterms and, and talk about um, the, uh, <laughs> the, all that uh, environment going into the uh, 2014 midterms and those important elections. Um, and please save the date for our Veterans Day program, uh, November 11th at 10 a.m. That program is free and open to the public. Uh, as for our featured speaker tonight, Mr. Seth Davis. Seth is a college basketball analyst for CBS, and I'm sure you've seen his face when you watch March Madness in the Final Four. He's a senior writer for Sports Illustrated, host of the Seth Davis Show on CampusInsiders.com, and please check that out. It's a weekly online show. Uh, he's a Duke graduate, just like our own President Nixon, and author of two New York Times bestsellers, including the book we're going to talk about tonight, Wooden, A Coach's Life. Last year, we were absolutely thrilled to have Seth's father, Lanny, here. And Lanny is a trusted advisor to President and Mrs. Clinton. He's a crisis manager, and he was here to talk about his book, Crisis Tales. And since then, we just knew that we had to have Seth here to talk about his book, Wooden. Um, many are calling this the definitive biography of Coach John Wooden, uh, a man that many consider to be the greatest basketball coach that's ever lived. And uh, like President Nixon, Coach Wooden was a towering figure of the 1960s and 1970s. And the parallels be between the two are very interesting, and Seth's going to touch a little bit about that or on that tonight. Uh, you may not realize that Coach Wooden's record-breaking run, uh, you know, the 88 consecutive victories, the 10 national championships in 12 seasons, uh, coincided with President Nixon's time in the White House. Um, so I look forward to hearing a little bit more on that and a lot more about Coach John Wooden. And uh, after hearing more about this extraordinary man and, and how much work Seth put into this book, um, I'm sure you'll want to pick up a copy, have Seth sign it for you, and then take it home to add to your collection. So with that, it is my pleasure to bring Seth Davis up to the stage. My fellow Americans, <laughs> I feel like I should do this whole talk standing like this. Is it, is it right? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? This is amazing. I never thought this is as close as I will get to any kind of elected office. I'm up here thinking to myself, what would Jamin Winston, Jameis Winston do if he had a microphone and, a, and an audience? But I'll, we'll skip over that today. Google it for anyone who hasn't. Well, thanks, thanks for having me here. That was a wonderful introduction. Give it up for the poets of Whittier College filling out our... I thought maybe, maybe we'll throw you in the selection show this year. I'll give it to the card to Gumbel. And the number one seat in the East is Whittier College. Could happen. Stranger things could happen. Uh, what a thrill. It's very exciting to, to be here and um, you know, to, to produce uh, a book about somebody like John Wooden and um, to really try to make it the official definitive biography, a guy who'd been written about so much and talked about so much to find layers there. And, um, and this is a wonderful setting to, to, to talk about him a little bit in leadership. And of course, in, in, in my book, uh, President Nixon makes several uh, cameos, uh, I have to say to the chagrin of Bill Walton, but um, that was kind of uh, an interesting uh, dynamic between Bill Walton and, now this is Bill Walton before he became uh, an, uh, an analyst for ESPN. Bill Walton actually played uh, and he was one of the great centers at, uh, it's also back when if a league said it was the Pac-10, it actually had 10 teams, or the Big Ten had 10 teams. The Pac, it was, they, well they called it the Pac-8 and then they added teams, they called it the Pac-10. So this, things have changed, but uh, you know, the, the many famous stories about Bill Walton of course who was, um, 
raised by hippies before anybody knew what a hippie was. He was uh, from San Diego. Uh, he was a great high school player and the easiest player that John Wooden ever recruited. John Wooden didn't really believe in uh, recruiting. I'm sure your, your coach would be interested in no, I think in, 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 in his whole career, now he said, I, I'm sure he didn't count, but he said he never had more than nine or ten home visits in his entire career. So recruiting has certainly changed, but Bill Walton um, got to UCLA, and as you can imagine, John Wooden, you know, was a very, he, he, he was a conservative man. I don't mean that politically, I mean that in terms of his makeup. He, was, he grew up in Indiana, central Indiana, during the Great Depression. He had the experience of uh, getting married in 1932. He had $900 in the bank, which was a lot of money. Uh, in 1932, and he and he got he graduated from Purdue. He was an All-American uh, at Purdue, and a uh, great great uh, college basketball player. Gets married and goes to get his money out of the bank so he can buy this car that he had arranged to purchase and start his uh, new job and his new life. And he goes to the bank, and not only is the money gone, but the bank is gone. There was no bank, and um, like many people who came of age in, in the Great Depression, I. And I think that you know this is something that Richard Nixon would be able to associate with is just this uh, innate insecurity that whatever treasures you accumulate today can be gone tomorrow. So John Wooden um, had a streak of insecurity, like a lot of people who who achieve great things. Um, it fueled his greatest achievements and was also behind uh, you know some of his his biggest mistakes. So even though he had won many national championships, John Wooden felt like he had a lot to lose. And here comes crazy Bill Walton. Uh, now first of all, Bill Walton, again, may be shocking because you know, the big joke about Bill Walton now is that he doesn't shut up, right? If you listen to him on ESPN, he just talks and talks. Oh, this reminds me of the Bob Dylan lyric and the basketball and Ben Howland was terrible. And, and, but at the time, Bill Walton actually had a very, very bad stutter and did not want to do interviews because he stuttered so badly. And uh, John Wooden helped to build this protective cocoon. But uh, Bill Walton was very much involved in the anti-war movement, uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, uh, the Kent State massacre happened uh, while uh, Bill Walton was a student at UCLA. And Bill Walton actually got himself arrested uh, on campus um, during, uh, during a protest. And so, uh, you know, John Wooden, of course, was very upset about this. Now, first of all, one of the interesting things about being a biographer is you get to uh, hear stories that people told later in life, and then you go back and research those stories, and there's some difference between what they said. Like, these, these guys will know, am I right? As we get older, our stories will get better. So uh, if you watch the HBO documentary uh, about John Wooden, they tell this great story about John Wooden and Bill Walton. Um, Bill Walton gets arrested, and John Wooden goes to the jail to pick him up and bail him out of jail, and they spend, you know, the next uh, 40 minutes in the car arguing back and forth and why, and, and why Wooden was wrong and why Walton was wrong. Going, wonderful story, except for the fact that John Wooden was in Portland uh, at the time, and it happened in the off-season. They never really talked about it that much, so the story wasn't so great. But there was this natural tension because John Wooden, again, going back to that word conservative, you know, these words liberal and conservative, they've been so butchered. They mean nothing now. Um, but jo John Wooden, uh, who had a very strong anti-war streak, so I asked him, you know, I don't think anyone had ever asked him what his politics were until I did uh, the last year of his life. And he was a quintessential swing voter. You know, he was a, a liberal. He, he was a Democrat because his parents were registered Democrats in Indiana. That meant nothing to him. He voted for Reagan. Uh, he voted for Obama. So he was this classic swing voter. He said he was opposed to all wars. But what he didn't uh, uh, appreciate, John Wooden, was the idea that if you're going to have a sit-in at the administrative building, uh, somebody who, who's trying to get to work that day can't get to work. So now you're infringing on their rights. If you're going to have a sit-in at the, at the intersection of uh, Wilshire Boulevard and Westwood Boulevard, what happens if an ambulance needs to get through? Now you're infringing on someone else's rights. So uh, John Wooden would say to Bill Walton, you know, instead, of, instead of protesting, why don't you write a nice letter? You should write a letter that explains your views. And Bill Walton said, that's, Coach, that's a great idea. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do that. So Bill Walton, when John Wooden wasn't there, goes into John Wooden's office and gets a big piece of UCLA basketball stationery. And he writes a letter to President Nixon demanding his resignation. 
uh, over the, uh, the push of the Vietnam War into Cambodia. And he gets every player on the team to sign this letter to Richard Nixon on UCLA basketball stationery. And the last person who hadn't signed the letter was John Wooden. So Bill Walton brings the letter to John Wooden and says, Coach, would you, would you sign this letter? And Coach, and as Bill Walton describes it, and of course, you know, the stories get better, but he says this pall comes over John Wooden's face as he's, as he's reading this letter. And it ended, by the way, this, you know, really angry um, language and this and that, you've done it wrong, and we demand your resignation. And the last sentence in the letter was, thank you for your consideration in this matter. <laughs> Signed Bill Walton and all that. And John Wooden was very disappointed, but he did not tell Bill Walton that he could not mail that letter. And that, to me, kind of encapsulates really the main theme of the book and the main theme of John Wooden's lives and the main theme of, of all of our lives, which is, on the one hand, you want to stick to your principles. You want to stick with what's right no matter the consequences. But on the same token, you have to adapt. And you have to be willing to bend the rules. And sometimes when you have a player like Lou Alcindor, who uh, was uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar before he, he converted to Islam, you know, John Wooden had all these rules about being on time. You gotta be on time. And if you're not on time for the bus, the bus will leave, that's a rule. Well, Kareem was a little bit late for the bus. The bus kind of hung around for Kareem, you know. And some of the other players would notice, you know, there are rules against, you know, certain things. John Wooden had some, some I think he had a little OCD in him, you know, he was very compulsive about things, compulsive about team meals. And, uh, you know, certain rules, we're going to eat this and no soda. And then, you know, uh, uh, Lou Alcindor and Lucius Allen and Mike Warren, you know, the star players, they start bringing Coca-Colas to the team meals. And, and John Wooden was smart enough to let that go. He let a lot of that stuff go. So this continuing dynamic uh, of, of how to stick to your principles and, and, and when to adapt. And we all go through this every day. And, of course, the, the, the one postscript all... I'll, I'll, I'll add to this, and of course, with, with all, all due respect to our setting, is that um, you know when um, uh, when Wooden was winning championships, R Richard Nixon would send him uh, some letters of congratulation. One time, he called Wooden at his house, uh, and Wooden passed the phone, um, and everyone spoke with President Nixon, and he had uh, this very small, uh, modest den, modest apartment that John Wooden lived in. I, I consider it such an honor to be. Uh, have spent time with him in that den, and he had a framed uh, uh, letter that President Nixon had sent to him uh, to congratulate him on one of his many titles, and Bill Walton would visit John Wooden often, and he, and he joked about how he would sort of sit in the den so he didn't have to look directly at the letter, so that uh, by play uh, uh, went, went throughout their lives. It was, it was a very loving relationship. Um, so this is, the, this is the world that John Wooden came to, okay? So try to picture what it was like you go back to the beginning of his life. He's born in 1910 in central Indiana. He grew up on a small farm with no electricity and no running water. He actually had his own birthplace incorrect for most of his life. He thought he um, uh, was born in a town called Hall, Indiana, and some researches towards the end of his life discovered that he'd actually been born uh, in Martinsville. But the, the, the farm that he grew up on had no electricity and no running water. Uh, he had uh, three brothers. He was the third of four. Um, and he did have two sisters, but both of them uh, passed. One was three years old. She had diphtheria and she died. Another one um, died shortly after childbirth. And those two events happened only a few months apart. So you can imagine what it was like for John Wooden's mother to have to lose two daughters in, in the space of, of several months. And when John Wooden talked about his own life, he, very, he didn't talk about his mom much. His father was the most, the, the chapter one in my book is Hugh, that was his dad's name, the most important man uh, figure in his life, uh, and his basketball coaches and his principal, all men, okay, all men. And he grew up in central Indiana in the Great Depression, the Ku Klux Klan was at its heyday. This is the environment that he, that he grew up in. Men were men. You didn't hug, you didn't say I love you, you didn't express your feelings. So... You know, he, he, he went to Purdue, and, you know, he, there was no uh, NCAA tournament back then. They named them retroactively national champions. Um, so let's start with uh, some things that you guys might be able to relate to. Okay, what made John Wooden a great player? Okay, John Wooden was, was a small man. He was 5'8", five, 5'9", five, uh, and, and he was quick. He had some innate speed and, and some agility and hand-eye coordination, but he understood that he wasn't necessarily the biggest player or the best player. 
So he uh, understood early on that the one thing that he could control more than anything else was his physical condition. I can't make myself taller. I can make myself a little bit quicker, but not really. But I can be in the best doggone shape of any player on this basketball court. That's something that I can control. John Wooden was tough, man. We know him as this old, sweet guy reading poetry in his den. He was a tough cuss. Uh, they called him the India rubber man because he, would ba he, he had no regard for his, his body. He would fling himself to the floor and bounce right back up. When he was in college, his uh, college coach put football players along the baseline because he would have these drives to the basket and not stop, so the football players were there to catch him. So his idea was that if I'm in better shape than everybody else on the court and I'm in better shape than the guy guarding me, I'm just going to run the whole game, the whole game. And first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, the guy can hang with me. The last two to four minutes, he's going to be tired and I'm not. And I'm going to be able to make the one or two plays that will decide a game that's decided by three or four points. And back in those days, there was no three-point line, no shot clock, not a lot of scoring. And John Wooden was very fortunate to play uh, in college for a man named Piggy Lambert, also a, smart, a small man, who basically invented the fast break and played up-tempo basketball. Now back then, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, there used to be a rule that after every made basket, the game stopped and we went back to half court and had a jump ball. After every made basket, that was until like 1939. James Naismith uh, believed, thought of it like the kickoff in football. He didn't want there to be too much scoring in basketball. And when they had all these debates about getting rid of the, of the center jump after every, every made basket back to the center court line, James Naismith was very much against that change, and he got overruled. So, it was, but, so this was a time when, you know, of course, every, every uh, player on the court was white, needless to say, uh, and the, the center jump after every made basket. John Wooden played for a guy who believed in up-tempo basketball. They, play, they called it fire, uh, fire wagon basketball. So that fell into his thinking of physical conditioning. We're going to be in better uh, physical condition than our opponents, we're going to get them to play our style. We're going to run them ragged. And then at the end of the game, they're going to be tired, and we're not. And that's how they're going to win. So John Wooden took that philosophy to the West Coast. He coached in uh, high schools in, in Indiana for, uh, I want to say, 13, 14 years. He played some professional basketball on, on the weekend. There wasn't really much pro ball to speak of. These guys were teachers, and they'd make a little, make a little money on the weekend playing, uh, playing what was, uh, you know, then considered professional basketball, not much of it, but uh, developing this basketball philosophy of, of physical condition. So John Wooden comes out west to UCLA, and everybody on the West Coast played slower basketball. They were from the Henry Iba School. Pete Newell was the coach at Cal, uh, very successful playing slow it down, grind it out basketball. John Wooden went 14 years at UCLA before he won his first NCAA tournament game. 14 years. He won his first title in his 16th year. You guys think um, Steve Alford is going to make 14 years <laughs> without winning a game? A game in the NCAA tournament. So this notion of John Wooden being this great wizard, that he had all these great secrets, well, what happened? First of all, he developed his craft year by year, got better a little bit every day. Um, he was very detailed in his... Uh, practice plan, his, his uh, coaching philosophy. I feel like, frankly, many of the coaches that I cover in Division I college basketball, they're, they're kind of micromanagers. John Woods considered himself a teacher. Uh, in fact, my book, uh, for most of the project, the, the title of the book was going to be The Teacher. And then at the end of the, the process, the publisher wanted to call it Wooden uh, for search engine optimization, which is another concept that John Wooden never, never dealt with. Um, so he, 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 his idea was that it was his job to teach his, his boys how to play. And then on game day, uh, he would say to them, my work is done. When the game begins, don't look over. Uh, he never called timeout. He blew a couple of games when, they, when their 88-game win streak uh, ended. Uh, they, they lost a big lead late. He wouldn't call timeout. In 1974, when their uh, championship run ended against uh, NC State in double overtime, they had a big lead. They blew the lead. He didn't call timeout. He was the teacher, and the game was their exam. 
Uh, so he developed his craft year by year. And then what happens? Shockingly, <clears throat> he got better players. And uh, he had a, a little guy uh, locally who, uh, whose father played at USC. USC didn't recruit him, named Gail Goodrich. Uh, he had a, a, a kid from the playgrounds of Philadelphia named Walt Hazard. He had a starting lineup where nobody was taller than six foot five. And he and his uh, assistant coach, Jerry Norman, developed a 2-2-1 zone press. Everybody thought the whole idea, the purpose of the zone press was to get a lot of steals and fast break layups. That was not the purpose of the zone press. The purpose of the zone press was to speed up the game because we were in better shape than they were. Now, whether they were or not, I don't know. But that was his message to them. We're going to run. We're going to be. We're in better shape than them. So they believed that they were in better shape. Therefore, maybe they were. So 1964 happens, and... Um, uh, they, they go undefeated. They, they were unranked at the start of the year, and they, they go 30-0, and 0, and they won it again in, in 1965, um, playing with a small lineup up and down. And then uh, as they're uh, dominating, a seven-foot-one unbelievable prodigy from New York City named Lou Alcindor is seduced not only by the winning and not only by the style, um, but by the Hollywood-produced image of California as this place where the sun always shined, the girls were always beautiful, and uh, whites love blacks, and blacks love whites, and there was no racism. And he was seduced by that, and uh, that's why he went to UCLA. And so John Wooden went from not having a single player over the height of six foot five to having the best seven-footer that that the game's ever, I think Kareem's the best ever, by the way, coach. I, I, it's funny, when you hear people name, well, who's the best ever? It's, uh, well, they start with Russell because he won a lot, right? And it's, you know, Magic and Larry and Michael and now LeBron or Kobe. I think they rarely mention Kareem. I think Kareem was the best. But how about John Wooden having to go from a, a, a lineup of, of smaller players to now having a great seven-footer and how he had to adapt through all of that. And just when you think that, I mean, as a coach, how many coaches in their life get to coach a player as good as Kareem? And then he, and then he wins three titles, and then he has another guy come in who's just as good as Kareem in, in, in Bill Walton. And, and doing uh, so in the tumult of, of the 1960s and, and the early 1970s and, and everything that was going on. So that, that is, is, is a large theme in the book, how he adapted, how he adjusted, where he made his mistakes, sticking to his principles, always doing his best, but sometimes, um, you know, making, making tough choices. And you can imagine why it would be hard for a 19, 18, 19, 20-something-year-old kid whose world is being torn apart by this war and this uh, issue about how uh, you know, we treat the races and uh, everything that's happening. And here's this coach telling them not to get involved in all of that. Uh, if they didn't play, he didn't talk to them about why they didn't play because now he's coaching a different kind of kid. He's not able to relate to them on that level. One of the things I discovered in the book I think people are surprised to, to learn about is how much Wooden's players really didn't like him, especially if they didn't play. Am I right? Do you think, is there a correlation between how much a kid plays and how much they like their coach? I, I don't know if I'm reaching on that, okay? People don't think that John Wood, I, I remember not to name drop, but I'm at the Nixon Library, but I, I was having lunch with, with Rick Pitino I've gotten to know really well and Rick was very curious about Wooden, asked me a lot of questions, and I talked about how Wooden was very thin-skinned with his critics. And Bettino said to me, how could, he had critics? Like, how could anybody criticize John Wooden? Yeah, John Wooden was the most successful coach in the country, and he's a big target. And he had a lot of critics. And you go back to his insecurities about being thin-skinned, and this leads me to another of the themes of the book, which is that you look in the course of John Wooden's near 100 years on earth, and I make the case in the book that those 12 years when he was winning championships were actually his unhappiest years of his life. And he would say that. The book opens up um, the, the, the first page. The quote is uh, directly from Wood, and he says, you know, I've often said that for my really good friends in coaching, I wish they would win a national championship. And for those that I'm less fond of, I wish they would win several. And that's what happened to John Wooden, because at because then uh, it was like he could do no right, you know. At first, at first he couldn't win. 
Yeah, he'd win conference titles here and there, but wasn't winning. And Pete Newell, um, Cal people will tell you, you know, before Pete Newell burned himself out, he won his last eight games against John Wood. Uh, and uh, so first he couldn't win. And then when he finally broke through, you know, he didn't want Al Cinder to come. He tried to talk Al Cinder out of coming because he knew if Al Cinder came, he'd just be expected to win three national championships. And he didn't want to have to deal with those expectations. Uh, and then when he was winning so big, he was ruining the game. You'd be amazed, I go back how many columns uh, about John Wooden were about how he's ruining the game because they were winning these games by 30, 40 points and making a mockery of everything and he's going to ruin, which is, is, is so ludicrous. It's, like it's like the debate about Tiger Woods, right, guys? It's like, you know, is it better to have one guy dominating or, you know, having like a bunch of guys really good? Well, check out the TV ratings when Tiger Woods ain't competing, right? People love a dynasty, but that John Wooden actually had to deal with this prevailing sentiment that he was ruining college basketball. I mean, they put a game in the Houston Astrodome and put 55,000 people. No one ever thought of college basketball as a sport where if you lived in Florida, you'd want to watch you know, a, a team from another part of the country. It was a regionalized sport. John Wooden did all that, and he was, had to answer questions. Are you, you know, are you ruining it? And then if he would lose here and there, well, why did you lose? Um, and then later in his life, in his career, and after uh, he left the game, he had to deal... Um, with the specter of a man named Sam Gilbert. Now there's a lot of curiosity about Sam Gilbert uh, in basketball, and frankly, it's a major reason why I wrote the book. So who's Sam Gilbert? Sam Gilbert was a booster uh, who uh, was an alum of UCLA, technically didn't graduate, but went to UCLA, was a real estate, wealthy uh, real estate developer in Los Angeles, who over the period of many years lavished favors on John Wooden's players that were very much in violation of NCAA rules. You've heard of Reggie Bush. This was the setup. Uh, John Wooden did not uh, create this. He did not orchestrate it. He did not like it. He went to his athletic director, who was a very powerful man, and asked him to uh, disassociate Mr. Gilbert from the program, told his players to stay away from him. But at the end of the day, he had a decision to make. Do I keep digging, or do I put down the shovel? And John Wooden, like I think a lot of people would do, uh, put down the shovel. And the NCAA uh, had uh, plenty of opportunities to go in and look at this, and they chose to put down their shovels. And uh, eventually, um, UCLA was put on probation. Uh, twice Sam Gilbert was uh, disassociated uh, from the program, uh, and um, they never looked at the John Wooden years. Uh, in fact, I'll say this for Sam Gilbert. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, rumors um, and assumptions that he was uh, mafia-connected and people were afraid to go after him because they were afraid of what might happen to them. Well, and it kind of ended up to be true. And, you know, Sam Gilbert did something that everybody, I don't want to be a bad influence, but everybody in this room maybe should be able to say one day, he was indicted four days after he died. <laughs> he beat the system by four days, so I give him credit for that. But then later in his life, when John Wooden would be asked about this, you know, he would say, well, the NCAA looked into this and they found nothing uh, when I was coaching. Well, that's just not true. Uh, the LA Times um, did a long um, investigation into this in 1982 because the NCAA didn't. And they found that this had been going on back to when Kareem first got there. He was not happy when he found out, oh, this is still America, there's still racism in Los Angeles. And, um, was going to leave, and he got connected with Sam Gilbert, and Sam Gilbert took care of a lot of Kareem's financial needs and became his friend, related to him on a personal level where his coach uh, could not or would not. Um, so this is all a little bit more complicated than, than um, meets the eye of what we had known about John Wood. Doesn't make him a bad person. Doesn't make him a bad coach. Uh, it just means that life is complicated, and I hope that's one of the messages of the book as well. Um, that it's so easy in today's society to not only judge somebody but to do it in 140 characters or less and make these grand pronouncements about who's good and who's evil. Well, maybe the bad ain't so bad and maybe the good ain't so good. Life's a lot more complicated than that if you take the time to appreciate the nuances of how this man actually lived and, and, and where he came from and what he was taught and how he had to unlearn and learn things. Um, it's one of the, the great things I think you can, you can say about John Wood, and he had a sign in his office. It said, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. 
and he truly lived that. And when you try to get a little bit better every day, just a little bit better every day, and you approach life with humility and perseverance and all of the attributes in his pyramid of success, and you live to be almost 100, you're going to be pretty good. And so I'll wrap up my comments. I really want to, I prefer to answer uh, your questions because at least I know I'm saying something of, of remote interest to you all. Um, it, what's uh, been gratifying for me about the book is how many people have really responded to the last section of the book, which is winter. So the book is divided into spring, summer, fall, winter, uh, the last years of his life. Uh, you know, John Wooden retired in 1975. He was only 64 years old, and his last championship team was his least talented Team. I love when people say, by the way, well, of course Wooden won all those titles. He had, you know, Kareem and Walton. I say, yep, that's five. We got five more to go, okay? Um, so his, his last team in 1975 was his least talented team, and they still won the championship. He was at the top of his game. And his words were, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm leaving not because I want to, but because I have to. He's having health issues. He had a heart attack. He had vertigo. He uh, hypertension, he wasn't sleeping. The pressure, the criticism, it got to the man. It got to the man. So, you know, he, he retires at 64, and he's almost 100 when he dies. He lived a full life after he retired. And, and in those years, he did what he really always wanted to do, and that's just be a teacher and, and not have to be judged by a scoreboard about whether or not you succeeded or, or failed. That was the whole idea behind the pyramid of success. He was a high school teacher and, and the parents were so fixated on grades and it bothered him because a B for this kid is a great grade, whereas a B for that kid may, is not a great grade because he didn't fulfill his potential. So it wasn't until he retired that he was able to get back in that world. He lost his wife, who was his best friend, as he says, the only girl I ever went with, um, which almost ended him. It almost ended him. And, and but for those boys who um, didn't always understand him, didn't always appreciate him, and oftentimes didn't really like him, all of a sudden became doctors, lawyers, ministers, executives, teachers, coaches, and oh, by the way, dads. That's another thing you're going to find out, by the way, is as we get older, our dads get smarter, and our coaches get smarter, too. It's funny how that, the stories get better, you, you lose your hair anyway. Um, so these boys came around and they sustained him, they visited him. They, because now he was able to relate to them, um, forgive the simplistic analogy, but on a, on a feminine level that he wasn't able to when he coached them. He talked about their feelings and he was, he was man enough to, to recognize his shortcomings. And they were able to have closure with him and to have peace with him. Now, not all of them. There were numerous players who just didn't come around or just didn't feel like making up or didn't feel the need. But many of these, of these men came around, brought their sons, brought their grandsons, um, and he would sit in that den and he would read poetry. He, he craved, he would recite poetry. He craved that company. It kept him alive. It kept him sharp. I'm telling you, man, when you, when you sit at breakfast with a 93-year-old man and he remembers everything and knows everything and has a spirit and a sense of humor and a needle about him, um, he softened, he hugged, he said, I love you, he cried. One of the most meaningful relationships he had at the end of his life was with the women's uh, gymnastics coach at UCLA who just reached out to him one day and he was kind of a lonely old man and, and, and liked her company and she'd bring her, her girls and he'd sit there with these pretty girls around him and tell them stories and he loved it and um, he grew, he grew. So I, I sum it up to you this way, uh, John Wooden, um, shockingly enough, was not a perfect man and he did not live a perfect life, but he was an extraordinary man and he lived an extraordinary life. And for better, for worse, um, whatever history says about this book, you know, I, I, I say with all due uh, humility and confidence that this is the definitive story of his life. Who he was, how he lived, uh, how the times shaped him, how he shaped his times, uh, his mistakes, his flaws, his regrets, his blind spots, um, all of the contours and wonderful hues and colors uh, of his personality. And, um, you know, I'll always feel proud um, that I, you know, I, you'd hear his, I kind of appreciate what it must have been like to play for him because you'd always, I still hear his voice in, 
in my, in my head, and my, my kids are, my wife, are, I quote them all the time, they're tired of me quoting them all the time, but he had great wisdom because he lived a real life. He lived the real life. So if you choose to buy the book or read the book or download the book or borrow it from a friend, um, I hope you uh, appreciate uh, you know, the, the real life story of, of an extraordinary man and an extraordinary American. Thank you. All right, Seth. So now we get questions. They're definitely going to ask me questions because otherwise they're going to have to go back and do conditioning drills. So. So we're going to open it up for questions. Got a question? Yeah. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah. Can you speak on the differences and similarities between Coach Wooden and Mike Krzyzewski, the, currently the most, you know, best coach of all? Right now? Coach Wooden, Coach K, interesting question. Um, yes, I, uh, being a, a Duke alum, and I, it, this is one of the few occasions, by the way, that I've um, been mentioned that I'm a Duke alum, and it's, it was a compliment. Usually people don't like me when they, when they uh, hear that. Um, that's a great question. Um, of course, uh, Coach K, uh, his college coach and mentor was Bob Knight. Uh, there's not a whole lot of love lost between Bob Knight and John Wood. Uh, in fact, I don't mind telling you uh, that one of the more interesting conversations I had about this book was with Bob Knight. I don't know him well, but I was able to connect with him and uh, we sat for two hours and talked and he, I have to say, wisely decided he didn't want to go on the record. It was an off-the-record conversation. Um, so Bob Knight's mentor in coaching was a man named Pete Newell. Okay, if you the Cal, uh, Newell Coliseum, he coached at Cal, won championships at Cal. And um, as I mentioned, Pete Newell got the better of, of uh, John Wooden when they coached uh, against each other. And uh, his uh, primary protege was Bob Knight. And... Um, you know, Bob Knight, I, you know, I'm not a huge Bob Knight fan, okay? Uh, he's not a nice man. He's just not. Great coach, great coach. Um, but uh, one thing I'll say about Knight is that there's never a whiff of impropriety uh, with regards to NCAA violations or rules violations. Um, never. I've never heard an inkling of that about him. So Bob Knight is often uh, compared unfavorably to John Wooden because of his crass behavior. And Wooden, being Wooden, a little bit of a needler and competitive himself, um, you know, would, would be asked about Bob Knight a lot because they're both Indiana guys. And he'd say, oh, well, I think he's a wonderful teacher. I might not approve of his methods all of the time, but he's a wonderful teacher and I'd love to watch his. And that really pissed Bob Knight off, man. <laughs> his wife, Bob Knight, he did tell me this, his, his, uh, his, his wife used to refer to John Wooden as Mr. However, because whenever he would compliment Bob Knight, however, um, and Bob Knight was smart enough to know that he could not win a public relations battle with John Wooden, so Bob Knight was like saying, you don't like my methods, you got Sam Gilbert and his, and his money bags helping out your guys while everyone thinks you're St. John. You know, his colleagues called him St. John, um, and that was not a compliment, by the way. He had a holier than that. So nothing about John Wooden is that his uh, the coaches didn't like him, mostly because he was kicking their butt all the time, right? So, you know, Coach K has Bob Knight's DNA, uh, and has, um, you know, th that friendship and that part of the influence, but he does not have um, the less flattering aspects, we'll say, of uh, Bob Knight's personality. Um, Coach, uh, no, John Wooden uh, never cursed. And I'll tell you, it's amazing to me. You know, John Wooden had a very a controversial reputation with, re with uh, referees. He'd sit there with that rolled-up program and his, and his legs crossed, and he'd, he'd be giving it to the refs through the program, and you wouldn't know it unless you were sitting right there. But the coaches knew this about him. Uh, but of all the people I asked, I was, did you ever hear him accidentally drop an F-bomb or an A-bomb or an S-bomb? Nobody. So I think he really went through life without cursing, as hard as it is to believe. Um, Coach K has probably dropped uh, 12 F-bombs in the last five minutes, OK? So Coach K, he's, he's got West Point in him. But I think what, what, what I'll go back to um, well, two things really. First of all, if you look, I don't know if you guys have ever seen John Wooden's Pyramid of Success, but I encourage you to, to uh, get it, uh, print it out, and hang it somewhere where you can see it, because it's somewhere over my desk, and I still look at it every day. There's a lot of wisdom in there, all the building blocks of, of success. John, John Wooden, I, I said he's kind of OCD, maybe a little, you know, anal retentive. He wanted to be an engineer before he um, got, got it into education. The two cornerstones of the pyramid of success were industriousness and enthusiasm. 
So you love what you do, and you work really hard at it. And I think Mike Krzyzewski has that. You see what he's doing with USA Basketball. A lot of people say, well, boy, that's really draining him and the energy and the time away and how that added 10 years to Coach K's career because he's so invigorated by working with these great players and these great NBA coaches and working with Mike D'Antoni and Nate McMillan and um, Jerry Colangelo running USA Basketball. So there's this idea of having enthusiasm and working really hard they have in common. And the other thing I'll say is it go, uh, adaptability. Um, you know, Coach K runs this motion offense. You know, his, his idea is, uh, you know, Coach, you don't really have a system. Like, what's his system? Well, his system is we take whatever players we have and then we create something for them to, to flourish. If you have a, if you have a, a team of six foot five and under, you're going to run a different system than if you have a seven footer. If you have a seven footer, maybe you want to slow it down and put him underneath the basket and throw him the ball once in a while, right? So um, they have that sense of, of adaptability. Um, one thing that comes to mind that's different, and, and this is part of the era, um, is that Coach K spends a lot of time with his players figuring out what makes them tick. He really coaches from the, from the inside. I'll tell you a quick story about Coach K. I want to get to other questions. I remember my freshman year at Duke, I used to sit behind the bench. Um, I'd get a press pass to get there. I'd love to watch him coach and watch him work. So it was one of the first games, and Christian Leitner was in my same class. And we think of Christian Leitner as this kind of you know, jerk, arrogant guy, and believe me, he is. Um, <laughs> believe me. Is this, where, where is this video going out, by the way? I should be careful. What did Jameis Winston do? Anyway. Um, so it, it was early in, in Leitner's freshman year, and he did something that, that Krzyzewski didn't like, and Krzyzewski yanked him from the game, and it's like literally from here to there, and Leitner sits down, and, and, on one, and Krzyzewski walks down the bench and gets right nose to nose with Leitner, and he, cur I mean, he rips him and curses him. He did it quick, but he was very profane and very direct, and he walks to his seat, and he sits down, and Leitner, again, we think of Leitner who he became, but at that point, early in his freshman year, he wasn't a huge recruit. Leitner was um, in his seat, and he went like this. Right away, Coach K yells down. He goes, Christian, keep your head up. Learn from your mistakes. So he coaches his guys from the inside out. I don't know that Wooden um, necessarily took that same time. Took that same time. So, Oh, and they both win a lot. <laughs> All right, Seth. <laughs> it's a great right question. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. Book. Uh, it's thoroughly researched, and obviously you're a great writer. Thank you. Uh, all of my grandkids got... John Wooden's book, uh, Pyramid of Success. Uh, two questions. Why did he always call Alcindor Lewis? And the second one is with all the money that the players had, why didn't they get chump change and send he and his wife to Ireland where John always wanted to go? <laughs> Thank you for your book. Two wonderful questions, wow. Um, first of all, um, the chapter in the book, I can't remember, I wrote a long time ago, I guess it's chapter 21. The title of that chapter is Lewis. And it starts with the story of Lou Alcindor making this trip to California, and they take him around, and they show him this, and he goes to parties, and they, he meets John Wooden for the first time. And the way that uh, Alcindor always described it is he looked like the guy from the Pepperidge Farm commercials. <laughs> little, little parted hat riding his little buggy with his short sleeves, his tie, his, his, uh, his jacket hanging on a hook. Um, you know, it looked like, I think the line that I use in the book is he looked like he should be working in a three-room schoolhouse. And at that point in his life, you can imagine Lou Alcindor, everybody in the world kissing his butt, promising him the world. Come here, do this for me. I can do this. And here is Mr. Pepperidge Farm promising nothing more than a chance to get a really good education and if he plays well enough to, to play for his basketball team. And he called him Lewis. And that was John Wooden's way of, of treating him with respect. And 
and, and everybody called him Lou or Big Lou. He was, John Wooden was the only one who always called him Lewis. We're gentlemen here. You're a man and I'm a man. And we're not going to BS each other here. We're real in this room. And if you want to come play for me, this is how it's going to be with us. Uh, John Wynn will tell you that, uh, you know, Al Cinder in a lot of ways was easier to coach than, than Bill Walton. And Bill Walton, you know, when Bill Walton got between those lines, he was all about the team. And that's something that Bill Walton and Lou Al Cinder really had in common. They really and truly were all about the team. So I think that was in, in John Wooden's nature. You know, John Wooden, for all the years he spent in California, in Hollywood, he was still John Bob from Martinsville, Indiana. He never changed who he was. With all the adapting that he did and everything that he faced, he was, he was straight up Midwest all the way through. And I think that there was a constancy there and a respect there that Al Cinder just naturally cottoned to. Um, he probably couldn't have articulated any of this at the time, but it's just something that he sensed. And, um, and you know, the, he, the girls were pretty at UCLA, too, so that didn't, that didn't hurt. So, um, it, it was, y yes, sir? Oh, so you're saying when he called them Lewis after the name change. Oh, I see. Well, uh, you know, well, I don't know. You know, that's interesting. It was not... I really tell in great detail in the book the story of Al Cinder's conversion to Islam. So he's born Lew Al Cinder, uh, the son of uh, Catholics, and he's if, if anybody was ever too smart for their own good, it was Kareem to this day, you know. Um, heard a lot of his relationships, very bookish, um, loner, um, not, a nice, not a nice person, didn't have to be a nice person. Um, so anyway, so he, he made the conversion before his senior year at UCLA. And I tell the story in the book. He didn't tell any of the players. He didn't tell any of the coaches. Now again, here's John Wooden, who is a strict Christian, very devout Christian, was a deacon in his church, um, and went to church every Sunday, very devout. And being an older, you know, white man from the Midwest, I mean, so now we got, you know, a black kid from New York City going to say he's converting to Islam in 1968 with Malcolm X and everything going on. I mean, if anybody would have take umbrage to this, it would have been John Wooden. So I tell the story in the book of a bus ride, a long bus ride um, that they took on a road trip early in Kareem's senior year. And again, he hadn't told anybody and he starts getting into this argument with a guy on the team named Steve Patterson, who is a born again Christian. And they start kind of arguing about religion and Patterson makes the, the, the point, well, you know, if you don't, if you're not a Christian and you don't accept Jesus as, as your savior, then you don't go to heaven. And Kareem's saying, well, what about all these people in Africa who never even heard of the guy? They're, they're not going, so they start, but the, the, the conversation could have gotten really heated, but it cooled. And it, it became a thoughtful discussion about religion. And the, the players kind of circle around each other as that they're taking this long bus ride. And they really, for the first time since Al Cinder had been there, shared some of these things with each other. And Wooden kind of participated and uh, listened and maybe said some comments, but mostly just sat in the background. And that was Kareem's fondest moment of his time at UCLA, was that bus ride. And a lot of those players. And Wooden was instantly accepting of that. Instantly accepting. He was, a, uh, he was a pluralist. He, was not, um, he, he, he did not proselytize to his players about, he said it'd be nice if you had a, a religion, but what it is is up to you. And he knew that Alcindor would not have made such an incredible change in his life without really thinking about it, without really reading about it, without really putting deep thought into it. So I, I guess the basic answer that I would give in kind of a long-winded way is that going back to that first meeting in, 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 um, in their office. That was who he knew Al Cinder to be um, while he was at UCLA. It was not in any way, and, 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 and Kareem appreciated it. Kareem appreciated it. And he would call him Kareem, and he might say, you know, Lewis, Kareem to you. Um, you know, I, I just think it was John Wooden's way of affectionately remembering that time that they had together and the dynamic of that relationship. Um, you know, Kareem did not, get close to many people in his life, you know. Um, but he and John Wooden were genuinely close. They had a genuinely loving relationship. So I don't believe there was anything in that 
um, that was um, that was uh, you know protesting um, you know uh, his his conversion. Very very quickly on the question about why didn't, why didn't they ever send he and his wife to Ireland? Well, you know, Nell passed uh, 1982. Uh, Wooden retired 75. Um, he did say it was one of the regrets in his life that he never took Nell there. Um, uh, he, he was definitely not about making money, John Wooden. You know, you know what his coach. You know his his salary in 1975 was at the top 10 championships, $32,500. Um, so uh, you know, I don't know if they didn't think about it, or maybe they didn't have that relationship at that time, or Wooden wasn't interested in accepting money, accepting gifts. Um, but it was a regret that he didn't, he never took Nell to, to Ireland, as wonderful a relationship as they had. You got another question over here? Over here and thank you for those questions and for being here. Um, thank you for writing this book. I'm a thank you. proud UCLA alumni. Um, had the fortune of having a seminar with John Wooden where he taught his pyramid of success while I was there. And I have a lot of respect for the man. Um, I'm sure you know when they got their first national championship, and I'm sure you know when Sam Gilbert got involved with the program. Mm -hmm. I was interested in your comment. I haven't read your book all the way through. I'm about halfway through. Um, it's a long uh, book. You can take your time. Okay. Um, I'd like it doubles to, as a doorstop, by the way, just in case. I would like you to elaborate on a comment you made at the end of your talk about Sam Gilbert was the reason that you really did this book, and I'd like you to elaborate on that a little more. Well, I wouldn't say Sam Gilbert was the reason. But um, he was definitely a reason because, uh, you know, he even talked about so much. And I was like, well, what really happened there? Like, what really happened there? People say, oh, wouldn't, you know. And part of it, by the way, was to spell a lot of the myths about Sam Gilbert you know, and what he did. Like, you know, I think some people might read in this book about Sam Gilbert who would have heard about him all the years and say, is that all there is? Like, what did he really do? First of all, I... I find it hard to believe he never gave anybody just straight cash, but as far as I could tell in my reporting and what's been reported, I didn't find anybody who say he gave me just, here, here's 100, here's 200, here's 1,000, here's 20. That wasn't his MO. He was kind of a referral uh, guy. Uh, you need discount on tires, you need discount on a car. Go to this guy's clothing store, you can pick it off the rack and not have to pay. You can go to this restaurant and get a steak and not have to pay. He would shepherd these guys around town. Uh, he did sell their tickets, game tickets above face value, and, and, and pay them money for that. Um, but again, I, I don't consider that necessarily straight cash. Um, people may be shocked to learn that Sam Gilbert was the agent for Al Cinder and Bill Walton and Sidney Wicks. And uh, he represented these guys in their NBA contracts. Didn't take commission, but um, uh, had these guys over to his house. I mean, I sat in Sam Gilbert's house with his wife, uh, Rose, his widow, who just passed away, um, I think maybe not even a year ago. She was the John Wooden of English teachers. She was teaching AP English at Palisades High School into her 90s. Um, so, but what, what I will say is this. Um, you know, people ask me, like, you know, of all these books about John Wooden, you know, why would you think that... Um, that you would want to do a book that could add, add to what's been out there, the reams of material that have been out there. And my answer is, you know, that all of these books have been written by John Wooden, uh, for John Wooden, or with John Wooden. It had been since 1974, since before he retired, there were two books that came out, um, that anybody had tried to write a book about John Wooden, from, a, from the perspective of a historian and a journalist. So you'd read like, you know, I'm sure people, if you, John Wooden fans, you read They Call Me Coach, you know, so you'd read through They Call Me Coach, and I was, I, you know, I had these experiences with him where I would interview him, and I would write about him, and I would read up on him, and, you know, he would throw these things out there, like, you know, he'd write about the Final Four, and, you know, after that game, um, I almost went after him in the shower, and then the next day, about, about I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Or my, my assistants had to restrain me from, from going after him in the shower. Like, wait, run up by me again? Like, you tried to fight your player in the shower? The Final Four? That's the sentence, and they call me coach. It's, a, it's like half a chapter in my book. The kid's name was Bill Sweek. Got into his senior year. Was tired of being jerked around by Wooden and all the double standards for Alcindor and this and that. And Wooden wasn't playing him. It was at the Final Four, the semifinal against Drake. And the lead is slipping away. And uh, he wasn't playing, and he's on the bench, and he's pissed as can be. And John Wooden, it's funny, I asked John Wooden about this, and he told me his version of it, too, you know. John Wooden finally says, all right, get in there. And this kid saunters to the bench, you know, like he's to show Wooden that he's mad. And Wooden sees it, and he goes, sit down. 
There's like four minutes left in the game that's still being decided in the balance. So this kid does not sit down, coach. He walks down the bench by his seat and straight into the locker room. And he's thinking, I'm done. I'm going to shower. I'm going to get out of here. Uh, my friends are on spring break. I am done. I'm tired of this old man. And only because the door was locked and he couldn't get in at first, it was a delay, and he finally gets in there. And so they, they escape Drake, almost losing Kareem's senior year, and John Wooden books into the locker room and goes into the shower, and he's screaming at this kid, and his assistants are literally holding him back. Sweet old John Wooden, right? So that type of story, um, you'd hear little hints along the line. And I, th I think, you know, I have to say, when you spend enough time doing what I do, you develop a sense of smell. You know what I'm saying? Like, you smell out a story here. Like, there's more to this guy than this two-dimensional figure that's been presented in all these beautiful books. And they are wonderful books. I, recommend, I read them all. I recommend them all. Uh, they tell the story of a guy who never had a bad day in his life, never made a mistake in his life, uh, never had any flaws, never, no one ever said anything bad about him. So to me, it's not like I want to take this guy down. I want to fill in that third dimension and tell the real story uh, in his life in a way that's complete and thorough and nuanced. And yes, yeah, Sam Gilbert was very, very much a part of that. So I don't tell the reader where to come down on Sam Gilbert. I lay it all out there, and you get to decide for yourself. But it's all in there. It's good stuff. One last question. We got here, time for one more? Yep. And by, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick around as long as everybody's here. I'll sign for whatever. My kids are asleep. Don't worry about it. Um, so I'll stay as long as you guys want to stay and answer all, all your questions. Um, but you guys have homework to do. I, you skipped study hall to be here. So I expect you to go, you know, go chemistry and split atoms and do that stuff that you kids do. Yes. Uh, I have uh, two questions, three yes. depending on how you count them. Okay. I understand that at one point in your career you did stand up. <laughs> if that is true, can you give us the best two minutes from your act? <laughs> And uh, the second one is, who are John Wooden's heroes, and who are your heroes? Interesting. Well, the answer to your first question is, uh, no, I will not do my stand-up, because uh, I work blue if you get my drift. Uh, yes, I did. When I, when I got to, uh, I was hired by Sports Illustrated at the age of 25, and I'd always grown up listening to Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy and uh, George Carlin. Uh, love stand-up comedy, and like anyone who watches these guys, says, well, I could never do that. And I got to New York, and um, a good friend of mine was taking uh, classes at the New School in Greenwich Village. And, and you take these classes, and then you, and then you get up on stage, and, um, and I said, well, I could never do that. Well, I, you know, I've always wanted, I could never do that. And then he showed me a videotape of him and the other students performing their five minutes um, at the comedy store. And uh, or the comic strip on the Upper East Side in New York City, and I'm watching. And because they were students, they were awful, right? I mean, there's just like their first five minutes ever. And I'm watching this videotape, and I'm like, "Oh, I can do that. I can suck. That's no problem for me." So that's a good lesson in life, by the way. You can always do something poorly, okay? It's all. It's always an option. It's like people say about writer's block. Well, there's no such thing as writer's block because you can always write something that sucks. Believe me, I've done it. And then you make it better. And then you make it better. So. Um, so yeah, I did that for about a year, and uh, I, it was an itch that I scratched, and I realized that was not where my future was. John Wooden's heroes um, were of the personal variety, started with his father. You know, the lessons that his father taught him early in his life were the same lessons that he was teaching his players, and his kids, and his grandkids, and his great-grandkids, which is namely, um, you're, you're just as good as anybody else but you're no better than anybody else. You know, one of, you know, one of the extraordinary things about John Wooden is his attitudes about race. There are a lot of stories back when he was, you know, coaching in South Bend, Indiana in the 30s, you know, going to um, movie theaters and restaurants um, where, you know, he had black players on his team and they didn't want to serve the team because they were, you know, blacks on the team and they would walk out. Um, he actually coached a, a player at Indiana State um, who integrated uh, the national tournament at the time. That story, when it's dissected, is not as good as the one that Wooden told, but he had an unbelievable attitude for a guy who came out of Indiana at the heyday when the governor was a Klansman. Um, and, but it, it was never, his father didn't talk to him about race. He never put it in the context of race. It was, you're no better than anybody, but you're just as good as anybody. So you don't compare yourself to other people, you just do your best. 
Never lie, never cheat, never steal. Just do your best. Never make excuses. Um, his, they, they, they lost the family farm early on, and he was um, impressed by how his father responded to adversity, didn't blame the bank, didn't blame the person who gave the, the hogs the bad vaccine. So his father um, uh, is the first one. He had early educators in his life. I mentioned the principal at his grade school, um, his uh, coach at Purdue, who was a very moral man um, in, in that regard. And then, you know, historically, his, his favorite uh, figures were Abraham Lincoln and Mother Teresa. And he could quote, quote them at length. When he walked into his den, he had tons of books about those, uh, those two figures. But um, he was a well-read man. Uh, he was a humble man. Uh, and he liked humble people. So uh, it, it, it makes sense that his heroes wouldn't necessarily be the great coaches and the great basketball. He was a big sports fan, huge baseball fan. Uh, at one point was offered the job to manage the Pittsburgh Pirates because uh, he was such a, a big baseball fan. Um, but uh, yeah, th that's, who, that's who we looked up to. That's who we looked up to. So. So we done. Thank, Thank you. you. Remember to vote. To play music. Please. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you. And Seth is going to be stay on stage. Yep. Seth is going to be uh, signing books in the lobby. So please pick one up. Say hello. Grab a photo. Tweet it. Put it on Instagram. And before Seth leaves the stage, I got to give him this gift. I believe we gave one of these to your dad when he was here last year. Wonderful. One of a kind, what would Nixon do mug. What would Nixon do? And, Wonderful. Uh, we Much better sell than the what would Jameis do. We expect to see that on your show. Yeah, you got it. You All got right. it. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, everybody, really. Good luck to the poets. Good luck to the poets. <laughs>